have Nipun Jain, a director of medical IT for AstraZeneca. And he's going to be sharing some real life cases of where an AI system has spotted lung cancer on chest x-rays. And, and this is an AI system that's already been deployed in 18 countries. So welcome, Nipun. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Very excited to be here and a bit intimated as well because the panelists and the speakers before me were really great, so a bit nervous going. So if I make a mistake, I do apologize. Uh, my name is Nippon. I'm here representing AstraZeneca today. AstraZeneca is a global science-led biopharmaceutical organization uh, which is focused on therapy areas of oncology, uh, CVRM, which is uh, cardiovascular, renal, metabolic diseases, respiratory, immunology, vaccines, and rare diseases. So we cover a whole gamut of communicable and non-communicable diseases. And today, what I'm going to talk about is catching lung cancer early. Uh, the AI advantage we have, as Mita mentioned, we have been trying to catch lung cancer early, and I'll talk about the whys. Uh, using artificial intelligence, and we have an experience of doing that over the last about 12 months. And uh, what we have found so far is what I'm going to share today. Before I jump into the artificial intelligence part of it, I'm going to talk about the challenges to lung cancer survival. Annually, about 2 million people are diagnosed with lung cancer. 1.8 million people die from the disease every year. Now, why do so many people die from the disease? If you look at the chart on the bottom left of your screen, uh, the five-year survival rate for lung cancer is very low. In developed markets like the UK, only about 13 to 14% of the people survive after a lung cancer diagnosis within the next five years. Uh, even the best of the cases, only about 30% of uh, patients in markets such as Japan survive, and in emerging markets such as India, only about 3 to 4% of people survive lung cancer after five years of diagnosis. Uh, now, you may ask why lung cancer is such a big killer. Why don't people survive? It's basically because by the time the symptoms of lung cancer manifest, it is already too late. The, uh, the cancer has advanced to stage 3, stage 4. And if you look at the graph on the bottom right of the screen, uh, the rate of survival for somebody in stage 3 and stage 4 is really abysmal, right? But that doesn't need to be. We can if we are able to identify lung cancer at an earlier stage, maybe even 90% of the people can survive lung cancer after five years. And this really could be possible through artificial intelligence, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but before we go there, uh, one thing I do want to say additionally is, uh, not only we were already suffering from late-stage diagnosis of lung cancer, COVID-19 pandemic has made it an even worse scenario. Uh, in the UK alone, uh, an estimated 50,000 cases of all cancer types were uh, missed uh, just within the six months of pandemic, and this backlog has continued to build up over the duration of the pandemic. So really, this has become a problem which is even worse now, and more and more data is coming up which shows the diagnosis of lung cancer is moving farther away from early stages than actually in the opposite direction as we desire. Uh, because lung cancer is such a disease which can be treated if diagnosed early and the survival rate can really be high, uh, AstraZeneca has co-founded a partnership called the Lung Ambition Alliance. It's a partnership between commercial and not-for-profit entities, such as the Global Lung Cancer Coalition and the International Association for Study of Lung Cancer. And the ambition for this lung cancer, uh, a lung ambition alliance, is to eliminate lung cancer as a cause of death. Uh, lung cancer, as I said, is a leading cause of death. Uh, almost one-fifth of all cancer deaths across the world are attributable to just lung cancer. And what lung cancer, a lung ambition alliance, we want to do is uh, we want to double the five-year survival rate of lung cancer by 2025. So just over the next three or four years, we want to double the figures of people surviving lung cancer after a confirmed diagnosis for the next five years. How do we have lung cancer uh, patients survive uh, over a period of time? Uh, as I mentioned in my previous slides, uh, when a patient is diagnosed with lung cancer, it's usually very late because the symptoms manifest late. The lung cancer is not only localized in lungs, it has spread outside the lungs. And really, 
going into remission, treating lung cancer at that point is very difficult. So the thing we want to do is we want to diagnose lung cancer when it's still limited to the lungs. And when it's limited to the lungs, it manifests itself as nodules in the lungs. Uh, in order to identify those nodules, medical imaging of lung can be used, but it is really difficult to identify those nodules in the lung by a human radiologist. And the reason for that is uh, not all nodules, nodules can indicate lung cancer. Uh, based on the shape, uh, location, size of the nodules, they may be indicative of lung cancer, they may not be indicative of lung cancer. So for a human radiologist to identify which nodule may be high risk, suspicious of lung cancer, it's difficult. And that's where AI can play a major role. Secondly, because just because of the prevalence of the disease, it's difficult for us to launch screening programs where every potential high-risk patient can be screened for lung cancer. So we really need to identify a way where any medical image of the lung which is already being carried out for any purpose is actually superseded by an AI algorithm which looks at the same x-ray and identifies if there is a lung cancer potential in that just uh, image. And that's why incidental nodule diagnosis, which means X-ray is being done for any number of reasons, whether that's a health checkup, whether that's any other indication, whether that's asthma, whether that's tuberculosis. If you are able to apply artificial intelligence and route all the suspicious stages to a stage for uh, clinical diagnosis through chest CTs or biopsies, that's going to help us. And that's why we believe artificial intelligence combined with chest X-rays is going to be the game changer. Uh, just using uh, low-dose CT alone may not really be sufficient, and the reason for that is low-dose CT may be available in many of the developed countries of the world, but in many of the emerging countries, uh, low-dose CT are not very accessible. There is a risk of radiation. There is high cost associated with the diagnostics, and that's why chest X-rays, because they are so widely available across the world, and they are done for a variety of reasons already, for example, in the UK alone, 8 million check specifics are being done annually. Uh, so it provides a perfect platform for incidental diagnosis of pulmonary nodules, which may be indicative of lung cancer. Uh, now that we have established that chest X-ray applied with an AI algorithm, which can find suspicious nodules, is potentially going to help us identify lung cancer at earlier stages. Uh, we are now able to identify which partner we want to work with in order to do that. And when AstraZeneca, as part of Lung Ambition Alliance, was trying to find an AI algorithm to be able to do that, we picked a partner called CureAI, which is a health tech company based out of India, uh, which uh, specializes in AI medical imaging workflows and algorithms. Uh, CureAI, across its product portfolio, has a chest X-ray algorithm called QXR, uh, which is an AI algorithm to detect suspicious lung nodules and triage patients which may uh, be at high risk of various different findings. Uh, they are able to identify about 30 different findings, uh, including lung nodules suspicious of lung cancer. Uh, other modalities they are able to find from a lung X-ray. Uh, chest X-ray includes uh, tuberculosis, uh, pleural effusion, and multitude of other findings. Uh, so we partnered with Cure AI to create a lung cancer risk score. So whenever a chest X-ray goes through the QXR AI algorithm, uh, there is a CE mark approved lung cancer risk score, which classifies, one, whether the chest X-ray has any pulmonary nodules, and two, if those pulmonary nodules are at a high risk of lung cancer because of a malignancy risk score. So combining these two factors, uh, chest X-rays, which may be potentially lung cancer indicative, can be triaged, and a radiologist can actually look at that, and the patient can be referred to a chest CT or a lung biopsy for a confirmed diagnosis. And we are very happy that we have partnered with Cure. Uh, we did this partnership late in 2020, and just recently, uh, Cure AI, through the SPRI Healthcare Initiative in partner with NHS Cancer, uh, has won a $3.2 million funding to help diagnose lung cancer in the NHS setting at an earlier stage. So we really are happy that we have partnered with the company which is now being validated. And they have been published globally they have been validated across the world, and they, their AI algorithm has been trained on 4 billion data sets, so it's one of the most accurate and more uh, less biased algorithm which can work across all population types. Uh, we have, uh, as uh, Smita indicated, right, we have some real-life uh, experience implementing this solution across the world. Uh, 
how we have implemented it, we partner with local uh, in different countries, public and private healthcare organizations, whether they are hospitals, whether they are diagnostic centers, or even GP clinics, right? We provide them with this technology. Uh, chest x-rays, whether they are DICOM images in a digital format or analog chest x-rays, where an image can be taken from a smartphone app, can be run through an AI algorithm, and then uh, suspicious nodules can be indicated on the uh, chest x-ray itself. Uh, in the last 12 uh, months, we have launched this solution in 18 countries, and you can see the countries in um, the green color shown on the map. So I'll not read out all those countries, but we have launched this primarily in emerging market because that's where the rate of diagnosis for lung cancer was really, really low, and that's where we have started out with. 20,000 chest x-rays have gone through this algorithm. About 7.5% of those x-rays were identified with uh, pulmonary nodules, but not all nodules are indicative of lung cancer. So about 27% of them were classified as high risk of lung cancer, which makes about 2% of all the chest x-rays scanned were potentially flagged with a high risk of lung cancer. So if you look at 20,000 cases, just over the last uh, 12 months, we have identified 400 potential patients which may not have been diagnosed previously. Uh, now, these numbers may look really small. Uh, the thing that we wanted to do was to test this model out in multiple healthcare environments, in emerging markets, in different formats, analog x-rays, digital x-rays, different x-ray devices, uh, in a GP clinic setting, in a PACS integration setting, uh, and getting this launched in different markets with different regulatory environment was the learning experience. What we want to do here is actually generate evidence that once a patient is flagged with risk of lung cancer, we track the patient through a confirmed diagnosis by either uh, tracking them through their chest CT results or a biopsy results, and actually then capturing what stage the patient has been identified at. As you saw before, if we cast them at stage one and two, their survival rates over the five years are hopefully going to be very high. So we are going to generate evidence that we are actually able to perform a stage shift by uh, using uh, AI on chest X-rays. We are also going to partner with governments of the world to include AI as a screening, mod a screening mechanism for all X-rays being done. So if we are able to change the policies across different governments of the world, that X-rays being done for any reason would be screened by an AI for lung cancer, then basically we are able to have incidental diagnosis of all potential cases, and we are not hopefully going to miss any cases at all. And finally, uh, we know that millions of X-rays across the world are done for screening of tuberculosis. Uh, we are partnering with organizations such as PATH, where any X-ray which is being done for a tuberculosis screening will also get an AI screening for lung cancer. So hopefully, we are going to have incidental diagnosis even from those cases. Now, bringing all this back into the UK environment. Uh, so NHS has a goal, a long-term ambition that by 2028, 75% of lung cancer diagnosis should happen in stage one and two. And they are doing that because they know that if you diagnose early, the patients are likely to survive. Uh, towards that goal, uh, we hope to partner with NHS. Uh, NHS already does 8 million chest X-rays for suspected cancer, but 20 to 25% of those chest X-rays uh, which may have lung cancer are actually missed because of numerous reasons. It may be because of uh, long lead times. It may be because of less time a radiologist gets to spend on a chest X-ray. So there are numerous factors that despite doing chest X-rays, for screening lung cancer, lung cancer is still not caught on chest X-rays. So we are in discussions with uh, the Greater Manchester Cancer Alliance, where we are going to hopefully implement this solution across seven regional trusts in the Greater Manchester area. And our aspiration is twofold. Any uh, lung cancer, which is sus uh, any chest X-ray which is suspicious of lung cancer, we are able to put them on a elevated, expedited pathway to a chest CT. So they don't need to wait for months to get a chest CT. Anything which is flagged as high risk immediately gets a, a, a chest CT, low dose CT, and they are able to get a confirmed diagnosis as soon as possible. And secondly, we want to do the safety netting of normal X-rays. So an X-ray which has been flagged by a radiologist as normal is actually normal by applying an AI layer on top of that. Uh, so hopefully, uh, this gave you a good overview of what we are trying to do by eliminating the cause, uh, lung cancer as a cause of death. And I'm happy for any questions. And in case you want to partner with AstraZeneca to make uh, this dream of eliminating uh, lung cancer as a cause of death a reality, please come and find me after this talk. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Nipun. Um, we've got a good amount of time for questions, so please do put your hands up. Always a little bit tricky to see hands with the, with the lights glaring up here. I'm going to kick off with one. Now, I'm not an expert, so sorry if this is a really silly question. But I guess what I've been wondering about is with these amazing systems that are clearly amazing safety nets for, for clinicians and spotting things that you might not see uh, and so much better than a fatigued clinician, what about the risks of overdiagnosis, of picking up on nodules that wouldn't actually need treatment? And yeah, so uh, misdiagnosis can happen in two ways, right? Either you flag somebody who does not have lung cancer and you put them on a high-risk setting. Uh, that's a false positive. And the risk of doing that is you're just introducing stress in somebody's life that they may have lung cancer, but it's better, uh, you know, sorry, better to tell them they may have something suspicious than actually not tell them at all. The other risk is you diagnose somebody not having lung cancer when they actually potentially do. And the way we are proposing this is incidental diagnosis, which means that the X-ray was either not getting screened for lung cancer or they would be getting diagnosed at a later stage anyhow. So even if we miss, let's say, a small amount of patients, uh, we're still diagnosing 95% of the patients who would otherwise not be diagnosed. So we are not looking at misdiagnosis as a major factor for right now. Uh, even if you are able to, as I said, 2% uh, rate of high-risk cases being flagged, I think this is brilliant enough because out of those 2% of cases, maybe 50% of those 2% actually get diagnosed, and we are going to generate that evidence, and we are going to, uh, of course, with help from Cure, tweak the algorithm so it becomes more accurate over a period of time, and we are going to generate evidence. So hopefully this is going to make impact in lives of actual patients and uh, improve everyone's lives. Thank you. Thank you. I think Questions yeah. on the floor. Aha, I can see one here. Even in the back, yeah. Hi. Um, I just want, you touched on the extradited pathways. So if someone's diagnosed with something that looks like it could be suspicious, they enter into a high-risk pathway and that expedites their treatment. I just wondered what those timescales look like and how it compared to kind of normal treatment pathways right now. What this layer of technology, how that improves patient pathways and what those timescales would be otherwise? So it depends on different countries, right? In many countries, uh, we don't have systems like NHS where the patient has to traverse the same clinical pathway, right? They need to go, uh, so for example, in case of tuberculosis screening, if a patient is screened for lung cancer and they are flagged for lung cancer, then we just tell the patient and then they potentially need to follow up with an oncologist or radiologist themselves, right? Where there is a risk, they may not act on it. They may just bury their heads in the sand and not do anything at all. But in cases such as the NHS, we are actually going to establish workflows where the patient is going to be referred uh, for a low-dose CT and they are going to be prioritized. We have not gone live with that yet. Uh, the data is going to come out, but we are going to have metrics about uh, what's the lead time for a patient to get uh, referred. And we are even going to track uh, if the lead time improves over a period of time. So one of the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm potentially not allowed to talk about it because it's in the future, but we are going to have metrics about how soon the patient needs to be referred, right? And what kind of diagnostic pathway they need to be put into. And lung cancer is actually not the only pathway they can be put into. Uh, we just released some data that X-rays can also diagnose heart failure, if a chest X-ray. And we just presented this data at the ACC Congress just two days ago. So I'm not allowed to talk about it yet. But you can put patients on multiple pathways based on any number of findings you can have on a chest X-ray. And the lead time, we are going to calculate. But we, I don't have any numbers for you right now. We have time for one more question. Yeah, hi. <laughs> yeah, so I just, this is more of an operational question, but since you work in uh, developing countries, emerging markets, uh, say you're working in Nigeria, for example, the x-rays come out as like films, and basically I wonder how these films would then be passed into an algorithm to then use, you know, to then scan for these uh, uh, lung cancer modules or that you were talking about, um, you know, because I don't think there's like a digital copy of the X-ray, no. right? Yeah. So I'm just wondering how that works. So uh, we are able to, uh, we actually have a smartphone app uh, that once you, of course, you prove yourself 
being an HCP, right? It's not a patient-facing app. We don't want patients to uh, do their own X-ray uh, screening for lung cancer. So once you are able to validate that you are an HCP, you can actually download the app and take an image of an analog X-ray film, and uh, then uh, you know the image, which is now digitized through your smartphone. Uh, of course, because of different uh, level of quality of smartphone cameras, different lighting conditions, and user skill set in taking the nice photograph, the accuracy of finding suspicious nodules is going to be low, but we have a solution for that. Uh, but mostly, mostly we are trying to uh, target those centers which already have digital X-rays, DICOM images, and have a large patient footfall because that's where the incidental diagnosis makes more sense. Uh, somebody who needs a second opinion, uh, we do recommend that if you can go for a digital X-rays, the accuracy of the AL Gartham is going to be much more higher. Thank you so much. I'm um, afraid we're out of time, but I know this lady here in the front had a question, so if you wouldn't I'll mind sticking just... around. and uh, Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. We are going to... Good one. <laughs>